Oke. Oke. Oh, we have to start the webinar. Right? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's event titled The Charm Albanians of Greece, 77 Years in Denial. My name is Denny. I am a senior at Harvard, and I will be the moderator of today's event. This event came about as I've always been intrigued by the charm issue and also bothered by its lack of awareness and recognition and also its represent misrepresentation or denial. So before graduating and leaving Harvard in a few weeks, I really wanted to organize something that can bring awareness on the issue and also on the atrocities and injustices faced by Cham Albanians. So we really appreciate all 700 of you being here with us on a Sunday morning to learn and talk about Chamaria. And in fact, this is also our organization's biggest event yet. Uh, today, we are honored to be joined by Dr. Issa Blumi. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Rudina Yassini will not be joining us today. Uh, as she's not feeling well, but we still have a presentation video from her. Uh, we wish Dr. Yassini a full and swift recovery. Um, and, you know, hopefully in the future, we can also um, host her again at Harvard. Uh, in today's event, uh, we will hear from presentations from both speakers. Uh, and then we'll have a Q&A with the audience. If you have any questions during uh, the presentation of Dr. Blumi, please type them into the Q&A box and we will have time to answer them uh, at the end. Uh, so first we will hear from Dr. Issa Blumi. Dr. Issa Blumi, whose father was from Peya Kosova, is an associate professor of Turkish and Middle Eastern studies at Stockholm University. His latest work covers the late Ottoman period and successor regimes, arguing that the post-World War I era unleashed processes that interlink the Balkans to arenas traditionally seen beyond the relevance of these regions. In this respect, Dr. Blumi explores in a comparative, integrated manner how late and post-Ottoman communities, including Albanians, fit into what is a global story of transition. This was explored in his 2011 book, Reinstating the Ottomans, which accounts for the events leading to the creation of the Albanian state within a new framework. His 2012 book, Foundations of Modernity, Human Agency and the Imperial State, and his 2013 book, Ottoman Refugees, 1878-1939, Migration in a Post-Imperial World, also tie in the events in the Balkans, especially Albanian inhabited regions to the larger world. He also co-edited a volume on the Balkan Wars, 1912 to 1913 in 2013. His latest book focuses on events in Yemen and is entitled Destroying Yemen, what chaos in Arabia tells us about the world. Uh, with that being said, Dr. Blumi, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Denny, and to the Albanian American Student Association at Harvard University. It's uh, wonderful to see such activism. Um, and despite coronavirus and, uh, and all the other impediments to actually being an activist organization, uh, you nevertheless have been successfully putting together uh, such a uh, webinar. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm going to now share slides because time is limited uh, to help put some kind of historical context and foundations to the story, this tragic story of the Shamriya, uh, which I will now share here uh, with the beginning slide here. And um, I will then start the slideshow with um, a reminder that uh, while the region has obviously been inhabited since antiquity, um, that, um, and certainly in the last uh, 
10, 20,000 years, humanity has been evolving and, and with the Balkans being very much the heart and center of the Mediterranean world. Uh, the region that we're covering uh, um, is increasingly being identified as a distinctive one only in the 19th century. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, most uh, eloquently presented by Napoleon's um, initial uh, council uh, representative in the region. Um, in 1826, a book was published which actually highlights uh, as a distinctive region on a map to the larger region uh, public in Europe, allowing for um, us to uh, start to understand what actually makes uh, the, the, the dynamics of Chamerie so important understanding uh, both European history in the 19th and 20th century, but I would suggest also the larger world. Uh, for all the wrong reasons, Chamerie is a, an important um, filter to understand what is happening in the larger world, where peoples like those in Chamaria will have to bear the brunt of um, the, what I call elsewhere these transitional uh, regimes, which includes, if necessary, their expulsion from their homelands in order to accommodate larger political economic calculations. And this is indeed the case uh, with uh, Chamaria, unfortunately. There's been a lot of efforts throughout the 19th and 20th century, especially the 20th century, however, to uh, demographically engineer the region using uh, cynically uh, the universal declarations about rights and about, especially in reference to something called ethno-national groups, which leaves Chamri in particular excluded from the subsequent calculations that are made by powerful interests in Europe, United States, after World War I, um, manifested most, um, most prominently with the Treaty of Lausanne, where the peoples of Chamri, and I would suggest the larger Balkans, were betrayed by power interests uh, that had nothing to do with the long-term stability of the region, and indeed contributed to the expulsion of uh, um, hundreds of thousands of peoples of the region and ending up um, in um, living in enduring uh, um, existence as diasporas throughout the world, especially Shabdar, but uh, Chamri in particular, as we are covering today. Uh, so ultimately, this legacy of all too familiar story, one that is shared by many, many peoples, uh, ironically enough, even some of the peoples who will be actively involved in uh, expelling Cham from uh, the region, from their homelands, uh, are, are, um, include 150,000 people who are now seeing themselves in presenting themselves in the larger world as from Chamaria, living in Turkey, or in, even in the United States, in Boston and Chicago in particular. So our meeting today is actually is trying to seek and explain how we get to this uh, terrible situation that we now have to remember this, these events uh, with sadness, of course, but maybe with some insistence that uh, there's something to learn from this. Uh, ways of telling a late imperial story is one that I've been struggling to present to a larger audience who are often stuck with these uh, 20th century ideas of how we understand human interactions on the basis of separate ethnic group identities. Sadly for Shibdar, for Albanians, that also extends to uh, we having to somehow account for why we are a, sh a people who share a common uh, a common uh, sensibility, but despite the fact that we are religiously quite diverse as a peoples. Um, uh, indeed, uh, Albanians of the Balkans are one of the last, uh, let's say, legacies of a world that existed prior to the nation state that was shaped by European American interest predicated on differentiating people along religious lines. Uh, not so much linguistic lines for people like Fanoli, who was an important um, intermediary in this process of transition, very much an Ottoman man um, who, born in Bulgaria, was a byproduct of violence. His parents had to leave his homelands around Korcha, which in very much uh, has an intimate relationship with Chamria. He ends up in, uh, of all places, um, Boston, to become um, the first uh, ruler of an economical um, but nevertheless national uh, ch church that would highlight the distinctiveness of Albanian Orthodox Christians in, in the larger world uh, in the 1920s. But his story is a multi-regional one that has to uh, include the whole story of Chamaria as we learn why they ultimately, the peoples of Chamaria have to be expelled from their homelands. 
So we're looking at uh, a, an interesting story that integrates the um, Boston, um, again, Fan Oli is a student of Harvard, ironically enough, uh, if indeed if he was alive today and maybe Denny Hoja or Arba or Gred could be the next Fan Oli um, and, and, and pushing forward a new uh, century of uh, activism that um, in an intelligent way brings our stories to the larger world in, in more refreshing ways than the 20th century, unfortunately, has proven to be an utter failure for especially Chamriya. One of the highlights I wish to make here is there's some of this strange irony is that one Fanoli and his uh, other activists who had come from the Balkans, Balkan homelands, actually had to go through the intermediary phase of actually living in Cairo in Egypt or working with uh, Balkan uh, migrants who settled in Egypt and his biggest supporters including some of the founders of the intellectual and cultural elites of Egypt in the end of the 19th century, um, were also ones who were actively trying to find a space for Albanians to actually articulate their place in the larger world. And it's one of those uh, interesting ironies that indeed we would not have the whole story of Fanoli's emergence as a both cultural, political, and uh, religious leader if it wasn't for the intervention of an Archbishop, Arch, Archbishop Platon of the Russian church who actually uh, commissioned Noli and recognized, ordained him as a priest in 1908. Now we associate of course Russia with very different kind of relationship with Albanians in the, in the 20th century, but this is one of those important kind of moments where uh, economical exchange is actually necessary and possible to, rec to recognize and highlight if we want to tell our st stories of the past more accurately. Uh, crucially, the whole context of Noli's journey and the, the journey of all those Albanian activists who made a home out of Boston and New York and actually would be crucial to shaping what would become the initial efforts of creating an independent Albanian state despite the fact that Chamri would be left out of those boundaries, as well as Kosovo and large swaths of Western, what today is Macedonia. Um, we need to look at the early 20th, 19th century to appreciate why this uh, territorial disaggregation was necessary. And it leads us to a very interesting figure for Chamri's history, in particular, Ali Pasha of Tepelena, still um, acknowledged and recognized in Al Albanian history books, but his place in the larger world largely forgotten in the process of making him an Albanian, as opposed to him being first and foremost an Ottoman subject in the Balkans. Uh, because this, the regions that he would be um, explicitly ruling over was very much a place that became, by the end of the uh, 18th and early 19th centuries, a place of intrigues that engaged Dubrovnik, Venice, France, the Habsburg Empire, the Kingdom of Napoli, Sicily, and Sicilia, and, um, and the Russians as well, as well as the British. And so the, the very presence in which Ali Pasha and very loyal troops around him who were multilingual, but most likely of what we would, today we would call Albanians of both Christian and Muslim heritage uh, was able by 1803 to really become the dominant player in this larger area of Yanya, the, the territory of the Ottoman province or Vilayet of Yanya, larger Epirios, which is an important component to this story in the 20th century and indeed Chamriya by 1803. And so this region in which he becomes an important actor is a mediator between what's happening in the larger uh, European context, the Mediterranean world, which includes the Ottoman world, um, is an uh, important context for us understanding the evolution of Chamriya into an area of conflict. Um, it is an area, however, also of opportunity. It's a very rich region. It's, um, it's um, sitting on the Ionian sea, uh, and Adriatic seas are an important link, if you will, to the larger Ottoman and Islamic world, the Eastern Orthodox Christian world, and the uh, developments that are shaping modern Europe with the rise of the French uh, Republic, uh, Napoleon's rampaging throughout Europe, and the responses to that process. And this is important because Ali Pasha, who is very much uh, in, invested in shaping the eco ecology, the cultural ecology and the economy of this region, it is in many ways a superpower um, of its time. And um, 
by the extent of its um, independence, if you will, from larger Ottoman context, still very loyal to the Ottoman state, but one nevertheless that it's operated and governed independently is something that needs to inform our uh, subsequent understanding of what's happening um, with Chamri as European powers start to find new ways of dealing with the complexities of uh, the, um, the Balkans moving forward. Uh, including uh, intellectual adventurers like Lord Byron, who actually uh, interacts with this now very prominent and powerful figure in Balkan politics um, more, uh, uh, more globally, as well as Chamriya specifically. Um, and ultimately, his, some of his most famous epic poetry is going to be written in response to his experience of being in this uh, heartland, if you will, of uh, larger inter-European intrigues of this period. And I'm sure many of us have consulted some of the things that we're referencing this uh, uh, larger Yanya region, as well as Chamri specifically through his poetry. Um, Chamri um, is it, the, the importance of Chamri is also manifested in these initial investments in something called uh, republics in the Balkans. The first one becoming these Ionian islands that had a very interesting story, which probably we don't have much time to cover uh, right now, but I just wanted to highlight that this is a uh, part of the larger story that Ali Pasha, but also peoples of Chamriya are, are part of, that engages and involves their very presence in the struggles between the Russians, the French, and then ultimately the British who would acquire uh, some kind of um, a self-appointed role to shape the trajectories of this larger region from 1815, from 1815 moving forward. And this would be important because like Lord Byron, who now suddenly embraces the idea of something called a Greek revolution that had dramatic, dramatic implications for all the peoples of the Southern Balkans, uh, this would be a continuation of a struggle of finding out how to mediate and accommodate all these peoples who are uh, don't still fit the categories that we use in the 20th century to talk about the Balkans, distinctive ethno-national groups who are somehow necessarily hostile to each other, or religious communities that somehow cannot be accommodated in living and live with each other. Obviously, for some 500 years of Ottoman history in the Balkans, that was not the case. So something is happening in the in middle of the 19th century, which has unfortunately the hands of the British and other adventures from your larger Europe and eventually the United States to account for it. Uh, it must be highlighted even one of the founders of the, uh, the really much smaller entity that would become known as the Albanian state in 1912 was actually advocating trying to forge a union, but was by 1907 a, a, a relatively thriving kingdom of Greece that still accommodated large numbers of non-Greek speakers uh, and, and especially Muslims in these um, projected uh, territorial alliances. So one of the main important actors um, who are often um, conveniently um, erased from the larger story of the Southern Balkans is the very presence of peoples who um, made the, the emergence of some of these non-Albanian states possible, whether it be the Arvanites or, or, or Abror or other peoples who are associated with the struggle for a kind of reorientation, political reorientation of the Southern Balkans. Um, which ultimately leads to the creation of a, a kingdom led by a Bavarian king of something that would be associated in the 20th century with the modern state of Greece is actually a project that subsequently uh, um, and requires ethnocide, an ethnocide that is not exclusively Albanian, but is one in which peoples who are could be easily many, many different things at the same time now needs to be paired off and isolated as distinctive ethno-national groups. So I count this as being a, both a progressive and very aggressive hostile period of ethnocide that extends to, again, the story of potentially reread as brother fighting brother, brother killing brother with the case of Muhammad Ali Pasha from Kavala, an Albanian speaker from uh, what would later become Northern Greece, um, sending his son and his most loyal soldiers to fight and try to suppress this outburst of European intervention in what was then Ottoman Balkan politics. And so again, you have this sad rewriting of this whole enterprise where 
peoples of, of shared cultural um, complexities are now going to be written retrospectively as separated between Greeks and Albanians, between Muslims and Christians, where in fact they were uh, often fighting on both sides of the struggle for the creation of something that becomes by 1832 a Bavarian ruled kingdom in um, southern Balkans. And again, uh, the story of the Balkans extends deep into the tropical zones of Sudan today. Uh, Albanians um, and, and, and Greek speakers and Romanians who spent considerable amounts of time working um, on, on this enterprise to see Egyptian expansion in the 19th century is part also of the story that ultimately leads to Chamriya's destruction at the beginning of the 20th century. So the, this, this kind of sad irony is that um, bring and conjoin distinctive, disparate uh, peoples of the Balkans, what today we would call Albanians um, if, if we were pushed, um, leads to Albanian killing Albanian, Balkan uh, native killing Balkan native, uh, Christians and Muslims killing Christians and Muslims over territories that would become then the enterprise that ultimately led to the destruction of the peoples of Chamriya who were much, very much part and integrated into this larger process. So by 1830s, we were really talking about a very new kind of orientation. European powers have now introduced a precedent that would uh, lead for the next hundred years to the parceling out of these territories uh, along lines of distinction that most people of the Balkans still did not accept. They resisted this, and this is the, one of the reasons why I accounted for how and what was happening over this 100 plus year period um, is as an alternative way of looking at modernities in the Balkans. It's a tragic story in which peoples of the Balkans are now being pushed by outside forces to adopt very different ideas about what their future should hold. And this would be devastating for peoples of Chamri, unfortunately. And, and throughout the course of the rest of the 20, uh, 19th century, we have key uh, interventions that highlights the evolution of Chamriya becoming a very distinctive territory that could have very easily, just like Montenegro or other parts of the uh, um, larger Balkans, become identified as a polity that could negotiate on its own terms uh, this period of transition from the Balkan Wars onwards. But sadly, that, that was not be the case for Chamriya. Others would start to speak on behalf of the peoples of Chamriya, and the results would be uh, catastrophic for the peoples of that area, where, again, the vast majority would end up being expelled, murdered, and their distinctive um, linguistic, sublinguistic group uh, eliminated from uh, the possibilities of living in harmony in this pre-World War I era. So Shamsuddin Sami or Sami Frashi uh, wrote in his very crucial um, dictionary, if you will, of history and geography, Kamus Alam, made constant reference to, uh, to Chamriya being part of the larger uh, Yanya Korcha uh, universe that extends deep into the south of uh, even Preveza. And even by 1910, the, the new government in, in Istanbul in 1908, led by many Albanians themselves of the Committee of Union of progress, or what in the West is called the Young Turks, actually created a subzone, a casa that would incorporate Chamri and be allowing these peoples to govern themselves. And again, this was an opportunity considering what will happen over the next 10, 15 years, the Balkan Wars, World War I, that it should have or could have allowed for Cham for peoples of Cham Chamriya to actually um, lay out a, a kind of distinctive political uh, require. Uh, entity. And indeed, they were recognized by 1913 as a distinctive group that required um, additional diplomatic engagement. Um, and, and sadly, this would um, um, also has takes place in the context in which Europe is dramatically changing its orientation towards the world. Um, it will use identity politics to um, justify territorial grabs that it, for the Balkans will lead to direct occupation by um, larger European enterprises and the investment in uh, internecine war where brothers would be killing brothers as a kind of modus operandi throughout the early parts of the uh, 20th century. So this progression that leads to Chamriya's plight as a kind of an isolated um, vulnerable region for annexation, for um, colonization uh, becomes fait accompli after World War I with the French 
um, the, uh, the, uh, the Italians, uh, the British investing heavily in the, grow in the growing ex and expanding um, power of the kingdom of Greece into the areas that would become the, what we know as the borderlands between something of the Albanian world and the Greek world. And again, crucially, this is, there is a larger context. The larger world is being divided in very similar ways. Africa after 1880s would be divided along very similar terms. That is crucial for us who are interested in, in making a claim about Chamiria rights and uh, to put this into this larger historical context. Uh, the Americas are divided along similar lines. And, and you look at these maps and you start looking at what you know about the Balkans and you see such parallels where destroyed peoples who are, would be submerged by bigger, larger political uh, institutional enterprises that will become known as nation states or modern states by the beginning of the 20th century as the working model moving forward, desecrating and destroying entire peoples who lived on their homelands for millennia prior. The same applies to China, which we are now suffering the consequences of. There is a, a new kind of uh, re, a revitalization of this history in China. They remember what happened to China. And uh, in many ways, we'll be um, the 21st century is a story about, in many ways, trying to right the wrongs uh, instigated by European capitalist imperialism of the 19th century. So um, population exchange becomes the um, method of choice for powerful industrialist interests in larger Europe. The Carnegie um, Commission in 1903 initiated already a framework to dividing up the Balkans along presumed distinctive ethno-national lines, religious lines. The Rockefeller uh, dynasty would pursue this further by uh, via the League of Nations, which it funded uh, and then um, and trained a whole generation of social scientists in the United States who would, again, strictly look at uh, the Balkans in very narrow terms that would basically cast Chamria as a, an afterthought, that one that would simply have to be accommodating to these new ethno-national states. You're either Greek or you're Albanian. And that would be devastating, unfortunately, for the peoples like in Chamria who uh, were caught on the wrong side of boundaries. And again, some of the sad ironies, some of the most violent interactions between those who would be expected to colonize the, the uh, Cham regions uh, would be themselves victims of this very process. Pontic, what we call Pontic Greeks, who are, don't even speak um, Greek uh, in the way that peoples in Athens did at this time, would be forced to leave their homelands in, 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 in the Black Sea region, and then they would become violent, violent colonizers, just like we would see throughout the larger world during this period, from the 1800s to the interwar period. So Chamria is a victim of a new kind of state building process, which entails colonization, entails violently expelling uh, the indigenous peoples or uh, stealing their resources to the extent that it's even facilitated by the League of Nations and subsequently the United Nations. So ultimately, the, although there's resistance, there would be attempts to accommodate a very distinctive group called uh, uh, peoples of Chamria. They were identified as such. There was some lobbying coming from this community who, again, being part of a larger uh, region of Vianya, uh, actually had access to power. They had benefited from being part of the Ottoman Empire. They were some prominent diplomats, some prominent business people. Uh, they were very, uh, it was a very wealthy region integrated to the global economy. So they still had recourse. But sadly, over a course of time since the 1920s, many, many other states, including Turkey, including the United States, including Albania, negotiated on terms that would necessarily have to remove, especially Muslim Cham Albanians from, um, the, from the discussion table. Uh, Christian uh, Cham would be allowed to be accommodated and assimilate into Greece, but that would mean, of course, completely um, um, shedding their, um, their reference as something distinctive to what was happening in this whole project of building a modern Greece. So sadly, by 1930s, uh, with uh, Zog's uh, government negotiating with Greece about what to actually do, uh, there was an attempt to at least get some kind of uh, financial compensation for lands that would be confiscated uh, and uh, where Albanians' lands would be alienated and taken over by the right of the state 
to uh, now redistribute that land to Pontic uh, Greeks or to the church or to the state itself. What we're basically seeing is that the Albanian state is negotiating and forming agree agreements on behalf of Albanians to receive compensation in return for their expulsion. And that's unfortunately the kind of precedent that had been established in the Balkans throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. And the peoples of Chamaria have been the primary um, exemplars of, of victims of this process. They're not the only ones, but uh, they are certainly one of those groups. And moving forward, uh, peoples of Chamaria should actually very much actively see themselves as part of this larger process. And if we do that, we can maybe find um, new synergies, new opportunities of alliance making, where other peoples who were, whose lives and whose homelands were desecrated by the growth of the emerging modern nation state uh, necess necessitated their removal to the point where um, this last phase and, and during and after World War II, a British ally, um, Zervas, uh, was very, very actively involved in finalizing, creating a final solution uh, to this Chamaria presence, which still remained a quite large population. They were the majority of that region, even during World War II. Uh, and finally, the, 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 the lessons learned from violence um, creates new realities on the ground is something that would be applied by the future Greek Minister of the Interior with British and the United States help because it, now it's the Cold War and the Cold War requires good form, uh, fir firm alliances and we know of course that Albania is now identified as being on the wrong side of this Cold War divide and if there are indeed any possibilities of problems within a Greek NATO state they, they will be addressed um, as we see with the case of Chamaria in violent terms. So I, uh, this is the last uh, slide that I've prepared for this. I was hoping to hand over to my colleague to talk more about the legal battles and uh, what, what now um, uh, faces the peoples of Chamaria. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious to see her presentation that's been recorded and hopefully there'll be some time for us to answer some questions afterwards. Thank you very much for your patience and you know, Wow, thank you so much. Uh, oh, one more slide, sorry, or no. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Blumi, uh, for that very insightful and um, fascinating overview of Trump history. Uh, and it was so, you did it so eloquently as well, uh, tying it also into the history of Norli and Ali Pasha and also uh, relating it to Ottoman history and also uh, global history. Uh, and its historical significance uh, beyond just Albania. Uh, and, and, you know, thank you. So thank you very much for that uh, very rich uh, and insightful presentation. Um, and now we will move on to our second panelist, uh, Dr. Rudina Yassini. Um, Dr. Rudina Yassini is a lawyer and researcher specializing in international criminal law and human rights law at the University of Oxford. Dr. Yassini is also a legal advisor on the defense team before the Kosovo Specialist Chambers in The Hague. Previously, she was appointed as an Economic and Social Research Council Fellow at the Faculty of Law at the University of Oxford and a postdoctoral global fellow at New York University Center for Human Rights and Global Justice. She has also held appointments as a visiting scholar at Harvard Law School and the Max Planck Institute for Foreign and International Criminal Law. In 2015, Dr. Yassini was appointed as a member of the International Law Association's Executive Committee on Complementarity in International Criminal Law. Prior to her time at Oxford, she worked as an attorney for the UN International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague on the defense team of the Haradinaj case. She has also worked with the legal team, providing representation and assistance to victims of the Khmer Rouge regime in Cambodia. Uh, Dr. Yassini holds a PhD in law, a master's of science in criminology and criminal justice from the University of Oxford, uh, an LLM in international legal studies from Georgetown University Law Center, and a BA in law from the University of Tirana. Without further ado, uh, we now turn over to Dr. Yassini. And as I mentioned before, uh, unfortunately, she is not able to join us today due to sickness, uh, but we do have her presentation uh, recorded, so we will share that now.
be grateful to the Harvard Albanian Institute. Sorry, is everyone able to hear? Can I have a thumbs up from? Oh, okay. Yes, we can hear. Perfect. We'll be grateful to the Harvard Albanian Student Association, Harvard University, and particularly to Danny Hoja for organizing this event and for offering me an opportunity to be on a panel together with Dr. Issa Blumi and a platform to discuss the legal aspects concerning the JAM issue. One of the most poignant features of addressing the past and gleaning historical truth is the urge to recognize and establish the legitimate search for justice for historically aggrieved and oppressed groups. Examinations of the past are often fraught with the perennially controversial nature of historical claims, as well as the debates surrounding the roles of different actors in committing, representing, and sometimes atoning for the historic wrongs. The daunting task of unveiling the truth, however, demands that we focus our inquiry primarily on documented records so as to better understand the past. Many aspects of the history of Albanian charms have been little known or greatly misrepresented thanks to a multitude of measures and enactment adapted within Greece. The decades since the dreadful events of the Second World War have prompted among the Cham people much soul-searching and a struggle for awareness. My presentation here today endeavors to shed light on both the history and the tragic event that have befallen the Cham community, as well as to bring into sharper focus the need to acknowledge the past wrongs. This presentation offers a general analysis of the legal tools as well as potential platforms to establish where the Chan issue can be litigated. The ideas presented here are my personal views and do not represent the opinion of any particular institution I'm associated with. They are based on my general knowledge of international law with the aim to evaluate how international law can be applied in cases of expulsion, murder, expropriation, revocation of the citizenship of the Albanian population of the region of Chamaria, which was forcibly expelled by Greece in the period between 1915 and the end of the Second World War. The presentation contains two main aspects, namely a summary of the historical and legal framework of what happened to the civil, political, economic, as well as socio-cultural rights of the Cham population from 1915 until today. And the second aspect concerns an analysis of the legal and procedural matters, as well as the potential forum where the Cham issue could be litigated. A long period of time has passed since the Cham community, then the Albanian ethnic minority in Greece, was subjected to the plans of assimilation and expulsion from the territory of their ancestors by the Greek governments that followed each other from 1915 until 1950, in which all pursued a strategy that had in common with elements similar to eth ethnic cleansing. It is important that we focus first on the historical framework, as this is closely linked with the legal dimension of this case. Following the Balkan Wars and the border demarcation of the independent Albanian state by the Conference of Ambassadors in London in 1913, the region of Chamaria, which lies along the eastern coast of the Ionian Sea between Butrint and Bustrica to Preveza Bay, was annexed by Greece. This historical moment was characterized by the beginning of continuous pressure a systematic policy by the Greek state and other ultra-nationalist forces to denationalize and ethnically cleanse this enclave. For that purpose, all manner of measures were used starting with the imposition of heavy taxes, seizure of land, ex exclusion of the population from participation in public administration, forced interruption of education in the mother tongue, including within elementary schools, murder, imprisonment, violent punishment, and worse of all, the commitment of massacres. During the First World War, different waves of ethnic cleansing took place. They were further intensified by the Treaty of Lausanne in 1923, the result of which was the exchange of the population between Turkey and Greece. 
extending this way its consequences on the Albanian Cham ethnic minority, which for the purposes of the exchange was considered Turkish at the time. Furthermore, 1944 denoted also the culmination of this ethnic cleansing where the Muslim population of the Albanian ethnicity, the so-called Cham, were subjected to inhumane massacres, where 2,500 up to 3,000 individuals were estimated to have been killed among those who were elderly, women and children. As a consequence, the remaining Cham population of approximately 3 30,000 30, individuals were expelled on the basis of purported collaboration with Italians and Germans, which to this very day remains unsubstantiated. A considerable number of individuals lost their lives as, as the result of hunger and suffering during the march toward Albania. All this activity brought the dissolution of every aspect of the social fabric of this community, making it a subject of acts that uh, constitute a violation of the principles and norms of international law. More specifically, uh, this activity brought the following, denial of the a right to life and physical freedoms of the Cham community, which included internment in 1940, massive murder in 1944 and 1945, as well as the forced expulsion in June 1945 of approximately 30,000 Cham from their homes. There exists an irrefutable archive that sheds light on the acts committed against the Cham community, against any efforts of denial. More concretely, in the archives of the Albanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, there exist reports that refer to the activity exercised against the Cham community by the Greek troops. More specifically, they refer to the massacres in the city of Paranthia that took place on 27 January 1944, where it is mentioned that on that Friday about 2,500 Zervist forces entered the city of Paranthia with the aim to use violence against the population of the city, which resulted in the killing and oppression of a considerable number of civilian population. A day later, Inhabitants of the villages of Dragomia, Armini, Carbonar of the district of Paranthia were massacred and about 600 men, 150 women and minors are estimated to have been killed. Another document in this file is concerned with a massacre that has occurred in the city of Ilati and surrounding villages in August 1944, during which time the innocent population was subjected to horrendous acts committed by the service troops. About 300 individuals from the region of Paranthia and Filati are thought to have left home and to have been imprisoned and tortured. About 250 women were estimated to have been kidnapped and physically violated by the Greek troops. January 1945 denoted the massive expulsion of the remaining of Cham population. Second concerns the denial of economic rights, the confiscation of properties and various expropriations were carried out on the basis of the agrarian reforms from 1923 until 1940, which were followed by other laws adopted in 1950 and 1960s. These legal acts attempted to erase in the context of the Cham, or let's say in the context of the Greek legislative framework, every right of ownership of the Cham community. The Greek legislative authorities have approved from 1940 and onwards a legal framework on the basis of which they have expropriated Chams permanently. From a legal standpoint, the existence of the so-called law of war between Greece and Albania has served as a tool to achieve Greeks' objective to transfer the asset of ownership of the Cham community in Greece. The third component is the denial of political rights, political representation at all levels of the government, prohibition of the use of language, symbols, including above all the removal of the Greek uh, citizenship, which was finalized with the Legal Acts of 1948, which in itself legalized the collective removal of Greek citizenship from all Cham Albanians expelled from 1944 through 1945. Documents are 
archive from the war, um, precisely from the war period, shed light on these discriminatory acts, which directly contradicts the principles of international law. More specifically, document number 59, issued on 11th of October 1938 by the head of Thespratia Prefecture, expressly states that I have observed that the Greek language has not been used in the offices of the commune, government and public spaces. It is said as this act is an offence to the eternal Greek language. On the basis of this document alone, all members of the Cham community were ordered to speak the Greek language both in public and private life, in bars, markets, as well as public offices. The fourth category concerns the denial of social and cultural rights, more specifically the elimination of the national identity, monuments and rich Cham folklore. All these denials reflect on the elements known today as um, characteristic or features that are in contradiction with principles of international law. Documents gathered from the archive of the League of Nations in Geneva and in New York, as well as documents of the British mission from 1913 through 1960, obtained in the British archives, have an irreplaceable documenting value. Altogether, they shed light on the phases of the ethnic cleansing, forced expulsion of the Cham population from their homes. These documents play a very important role, at least on four dimensions. First, they represent the anarchy of, of the history of the Cham community in Greece, as well as the tragedy that has befallen this community. Second, since many of these documents are already uh, public, they play an important role in raising national and international awareness of this cause, which is very little known or not at all known at international levels. Third, they constitute a potential base from where the Cham issue can be pursued from national as well as international tribunal or forum. Fourth, and arguably most importantly, this archive clearly demonstrates the violation of human rights as well as injustice uh, com you know, afflicted to the Cham community, including the evidence of an expropriation and removal of the ownership rights of this community. I want to talk a little bit more specifically here about the development of international law and where the Cham issue falls within this spectrum. Prior to analyzing the international forums wherein the Cham conflict can be considered or litigated, it is important to address the dimension of international norms as the growing sensibility of the international community opposed to the violation of basic human rights. Every society, whatever in size, be that small or large, functions on the basis of a framework of principles. Legal and illegal acts are entirely reflected on the consciousness of the community. The law and the rights are elements sustaining the members of this community attached with their recognized and accepted standards and values. The system of law consists of a number of norms regulating the behavior and reflects the thoughts and concerns of a society in which this law is recognized and functions. Such a body of law, such group of norms is reflected also in international law. However, the essential distinguishing characteristic is that the principal subject of this body, the essential characteristic is that the state rather than individual in the generic legal terms, it's, uh, it's important to understand the inherent and overt differences between exercising a right within a state and the rights regulating relations between states, international organizations, and in specific circumstances between individuals as subjects of international law. In this context, it's important to acknowledge that the judicial processes of the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials that followed the Second World War, uh, in which the General Assembly and of the United Nations first recognized the need to establish an international tribunal in, in response to the crimes uh, that have been committed or were committed in uh, following the Second World War. The 20th century was characterized by a large number of crimes against humanity, war crimes and genocide. It was precisely the nature and magnitude of these offenses that would act as a catalyst for the creation of the legal mechanism for bringing justice 
to those subjects and individuals and those countries uh, that were subjected to the crimes of genocide, ethnic cleansing, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. In response to the tragic events that occurred in Rwanda, for example, or the former Yugoslavia, the Security Council adopted uh, resolutions that led to establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the same went for Sierra Leone, Following the crimes that were committed and the genocide that took place in Cambodia, we had further on the establishment of the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. This further illustrates the growing interest and the sensibility of the international community regarding the injustice committed and once again reinforces the idea that what was until yesterday or what was considered a taboo topic is now entirely possible and that nobody, whether state or individual, cannot in principle escape justice. However, given that the mandates of these tribunals are of a temporary nature, an, a, Permanent tribunal or court was established in 2002 with complementarity jurisdiction, and that is International Criminal Court. In this context, it is worth understanding uh, what happens during these proceedings, uh, proceedings at this level. Guiding through decisions on genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, this process is proof that a high position can no longer defend an individual from prosecution. International law has already proven that those who bear the greatest responsibility for atrocities must be held accountable and that guilt must be individualized um, and avoid the label of collective responsibility of different communities. These tribunals have laid the foundations of approved standards for conflict resolution and post-conflict development across the globe, and specifically the leaders suspected of atrocious crimes will face justice no matter what. How this, um, this development in a way of international humanitarian law, international criminal law, and international human rights law reflect upon the China issue. In the absence of a diplomatic front addressing this issue, which would require as a prerequisite a serious political commitment of the Albanian and the Greek government, the only viable option for this issue is to be considered within the framework of international legal forums. In legal terms, three points of I think are of particular importance on the basis of which a variety of platforms can be developed in pursuing this issue from a legal perspective. First, the recognition of injustice. In every post-conflict situation which follows serious violations of fundamental human rights and crimes against humanity, it is essential to demand the recognition of the committed injustice. This element, in my opinion, constitutes the origin of any possible legal analysis of the Chan issue. If the Chan issue were to be addressed by the International Court of Justice in The Hague, it is natural that any attempt from the Chan community should be supported by the leadership of the Albanian government and should be pursued as a requirement of the Albanian state before the International Court of Justice. The International Court of Justice has dual jurisdiction. First, in accordance with international law, judges rule on conflicts of a legal nature that are raised by state and secondly it provides advisory opinions on matters of legal nature at the request of the UN or agencies author authorized to make claims before this court. Second, bearing criminal responsibility. This would require the prosecution of individuals responsible in the event that an, uh, and an undertaking uh, which would result from an orchestration made by various state structures. It is understood that the long period that have elapsed since the commission of these crimes makes it difficult and most impossible to pursue um, individual criminal responsibility in this case. Moreover, the principal element which can be hindered the pursuance of this issue in this forum is that, the, is that of jurisdiction. In my opinion, this platform is merely or not at all feasible. Bearing civil responsibilities. Here I will dwell in particular on the restoration of the property rights and potential claims. The European Court of Human Rights would be an appropriate platform to pursue this matter legally. Different perceptions have been reported regarding international arbitration, which in an ideal world and democratic society where the acknowledgement of the past could be a part of the present and future would be a potential platform. But the reality which we confront when an one party denies the very existence of what has happened, makes international arbitration not a realistic solution. 
In my concluding remarks, I would highlight that today exists an irrefutable historical archive which demonstrates potently, strongly, the offenses committed against the Cham community, resisting any attempts of denial. Reports describing the cruel crimes where thousands of individuals and civilians were killed and injured, tortured and abused in the camps and prisons, and thousands of others were driven from their homes, have far too long wailed in pain, echoes of which resonate beyond the memories of these people, must necessarily extend and expand across the international community. Finally, a very important task that lies before the community, the Cham community, is the collection of evidence, material evidence that would constitute a very important basis from any legal initiative and standpoint. Here I refer particularly to the need to obtain interviews with eyewitnesses as required by international standards. A long time has passed and the age of these witnesses make this task even more urgent. No doubt the legal proceedings resulting from the Chan issue will provide an opportunity to bring to justice those responsible for orchestrating these atrocities and to remove the shadow of doubt in ending the impunity of those perpetrators of violence. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yassini, for that uh, great presentation and uh, moving presentation as well. Uh, it touched on so many uh, critical areas and I'm sure that the audience also uh, really appreciated that legal uh, expertise. Um, now we will begin with the Q&A. It looks like we already have uh, many questions, uh, but in case you have not had your chance to ask one, please uh, click the Q&A box and type your question there. Uh, to get us started, I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Blumi, um, what are you, we heard a little bit from Dr. Yassini in terms of the legal obstacles, but in terms of uh, history perhaps, uh, and perhaps in terms of history writing or telling the story of the Chams, what are, what are some of the obstacles or the primary obstacles for this uh, lack of awareness of, uh, of Cham Albanians and how can we overcome uh, these obstacles? Uh, well, certainly uh, the needs to actually make this part of a larger global story that belongs to the 19th and 20th century. Uh, Cham Ria is unfortunately not the only case of such kinds of crimes committed against indigenous peoples. Uh, there is a growing movement uh, um, and there are uh, large resources now dedicated to telling the stories of indigenous peoples uh, in the Americas, throughout the continent of Africa, um, not so much in the Balkans, however. Uh, unfortunately, uh, cases like Chamria gets caught up in the whole story of the larger ethno-national struggle over uh, power dynamics of the 20th century. So if we were actually going to tell the story about Chamria, we actually have to, um, one, isolate it from a larger Albanian Greek story, but also at the same time project it as part of a much larger global phenomena of its period. It is very much a byproduct of the 19th and 20th century, as I was trying to argue in the um, slides. And one also other important thing to highlight is that uh, while there, there is issues about uh, property acquisition, the alienation of people who had um, property at the time, the vast majority of the people of Chamaria did not own property. And so uh, I'm also very keen on getting um, that perspective of people who are otherwise left out of the documentation in the legal sense. Um, because they are the ones, the vast majority of the ones who are going to be suffering first and foremost. If you recall that again, the, the, the extent of the negotiations was getting some compensation to those who had legal rights to claim ownership. Again, the vast majority of people of Shamani did not own any land. And so we, we lose their story in the meantime. Um, and so I think that's also one approach that we could take to uh, maybe turn the tables about actually making this story about Chamria a larger global phenomenon that could be compared and contrasted to other tragic stories, not to be treated as isolated and it could be easily just marginalized in a story between Greece and Albania or just another Balkan um, glick in, in modern history. Yeah, wow, that's... Um... Thank you so much for that answer. And now the next question comes from Gled Braho. 
Hello, Dr. Blumi. My name is Gerd Brau. I am a rising sophomore at Harvard University, currently studying for computer science and statistics. I'm also originally a Tom myself, so for me, this event was really, really important. Uh, my question was, as you probably know, Greece is technically still at war with Albania due to the law of war made in 1940. In your opinion, how likely is it that Greece will end the state of war and abolish this law in the future? It's a very, uh, there are advantages to maintaining this hostility, uh, right? They have territorial claims that um, on, on occasion they're able to voice in Brussels because they're a member of EU. Albania and Albanians in general most likely not see, uh, at least in my lifetime, a chance to be integrated into something that would give them a fair voice to defend their interests and de de defend, uh, let's say, a, a, a rethinking of the history of uh, the Balkans, uh, let alone getting integrated into the EU. That seems to be sometimes uh, now uh, dangled and then ultimately denied us when uh, things seem to be uh, getting ahead. Uh, so unfortunately, I do, I, there are lots of people inside Greece who are tired of this kind of politics. And uh, I'm part of a group that's trying to de-Hellenize a lot of the story that happened over the last 200 years. And it's a very useful one. Um, whether or not we're going to get larger EU funding for this project, again, member states have enormous power to veto these kinds of initiatives. And as, as of now, uh, as you can see with conflicts in other parts of the Mediterranean world right now, uh, identity politics uh, sells. Um, it's an easy way to explain how things, what things are happening. And unfortunately, we're talking about, in the case of Chamriya, Muslims, right? And Muslims uh, as an ex exclusive group are treated distinctively from larger European um, emotional references, right? For some reason, we still have not been able to bring our story into the larger um, spectrum of, again, a global phenomenon. And I really think that as a, moving forward, that's the only way we're gonna get to do something about this is work with our brothers and sisters in Greece who are tired of this kind of politics. And again, they, they, they are going to produce all kinds of archival sources that could be useful for us moving forward. If not to get compensation, at least to get a sense of who we are as again, a part of a larger Balkans, larger Europe, it may sound naive and, and wishful thinking, but I do see a lot of people in Greece and in other, other parts of the Balkans also embracing this esprit that uh, this, we have been taken over by a bunch of maniacs who have been running the show for a hundred years or so, and they've used ethno-nationalism as a justification to steal people's resources, to ruin the peoples of Chamunia and many, many, many others throughout the Balkans and the larger world lives. So um, I'm, I'm sad to say that I, to answer your question directly, I don't see much hope in the, this with these groups of people running the show in Greece right now. But there are few, there's there is hope amongst those who are not in power. Thank you for your answer. Great. So the next question is from our audience and it comes from uh, George Joka who asks, to what extent has the inability of contemporary Albanian politics to protect and advocate um, the Cham identity, even internally, has negatively affected the feasibility for possible justice? Uh, the way you framed your question is obvious that you know the answer. It's been very detrimental. Um, up uh, uh, from the very beginning of the creation of Albania and the political um, machinations of the 19th century. Uh, of course, the conditions were very different in those days, and what was what we could imagine to be the future was very different. This is one of the key things we have to remember as well, is that prior to 1912, the world in the Balkans was a very different place, and we had very different visions and hopes and dreams. And I think a lot of people in Chamri were still of that generation prior to World War, uh, to World War I and the Balkan Wars. It's hard to imagine such a world dramatically changing. Now, we, of course, are, grow up in a world where we just assume that there's ethnic tensions and that there's hatred towards religious groups. And, but that's obviously was not the case back then. So how are we going to reverse this? Well, we need a leadership that actually, um, one, um, deals with very basic problems for all of citizens of Albania, the larger Balkans, that's for sure. I'm not going to extend my political uh, views beyond that, but clearly 
to answer your question, we we need uh, uh, we need representatives that actually speaks first and foremost on, on behalf of the interests of peoples who are not able to speak otherwise. Uh, and another question comes from Yetmir Baha. He asks, um, "Can you comment perhaps on the role of Britain in the Corfu incident in 1946 with relation to uh, Tamaria?" Or, I'm not sure if you have knowledge about this, but this is another question. Uh, the larger uh, British policy was to um, strengthen their uh, allies to, from the war, which included these partisans or activists and these guerrillas, uh, which included some Albanian uh, groups. The um, Secret Service of the British did recruit and work with, and it worked with, even with Enver Hoxha uh, at some point, as I demonstrated in, in looking at some of the archives. But, it, but that by 1945, the relations had dramatically changed and the Cold War started to enter in. And so the British strategic in, uh, position was to look the other way, if not indeed facilitate the ethnic cleansing of uh, the border areas of any problematic populations that could uh, invite um, adventurism from, uh, let's say, the, the, the East Bloc that was forming. And the cynical agreements between Churchill and Stalin to divide up Europe um, extended to the cynical use of violence to uh, undermine anyone who could destabilize this project of solidifying um, a right-wing government in Greece that would fight the war against communism, whatever that meant. And unfortunately for the people of Chamonix, that meant they would be expelled. And unfortunately, Turkey was more than willing to accommodate uh, the, the arrival yet again, as they did with Kosovars and from Montenegro and from Macedonia throughout the 50s. Uh, the Cold War had, was just one new layer of, of a tragedy that meant the British and other power, outside powers were much more invested in uh, creating a, a new order, if you will, in the Balkans, not to try to sustain one that had existed there. So the result would be the expulsion of peoples and the, the loss of access to Corfu for uh, Chamriya uh, especially. Yep. And I noticed that the time is, uh, you know, we've run, out of, we've run out of time, but uh, there are still many questions. So um, I'm not sure, Dr. Blumi, if you would like to um, choose more or have time for some more. I mean, maybe we can take a group of questions. Is that better? Perhaps? If you can group them up, that's fine. Yes. I can okay, go on continue with this one. So there is a question from Alba Cela. She's saying, how are we going to start the discussion with Greece? How are we going to make this a uh, charm issue a uh, worldwide issue? And Zamira Guerra asks, if there is any legal initiative that is currently running so that we can help. And also some people are asking about the slides if they are available so that they can read that on their own time. Thank you. Slides are available to, uh, uh, for Denny to use as he so sees fit. Um, uh, you can even publish a book if you want with it. There's no copyright on my side, but um, just acknowledge that they, where they're coming from. Uh, also, with the Greeks, uh, officially, I don't think there's going to be uh, any kind of uh, mobilization from this, again, generation of political uh, entrepreneurs running the show on both sides of Albania and Greece. Uh, but I, as I said, on, uh, there is um, uh, grassroots uh, uh, recognition that um, in Greece, things have to change. And that's one way of, one way of we change is, is changing how we talk about the history of, of, of Greece, which includes more uh, all these peoples who have been systematically expelled or erased from the narrative, as there are still large numbers of Ar Ar Arvanites living uh, of course, many, many Albanians after 1990, 91 have settled in Greece to work. Many assimilated by changing their names. And, and that's obviously something that maybe we can um, mobilize their sensibility that maybe, you know, why did I have to change my name? The same applies to, uh, to Turkey, by the way. Many, many, many peoples who came from the Balkans were compelled to not speak their language at home and change their names. And up until early 1990s, there was a movement amongst people of Albanian heritage in Turkey to say, look, we have a right to study our home, our mother tongue. There was 
slowly but surely Albanian language classes emerging in universities. Something similar could happen perhaps in Greece itself, allow for the language to be taught, allow for this very interesting fusion of language prior to the establishment of the official modern Greek. There was all kinds of interesting fluid exchanges between people who spoke varieties of languages that we, today we would call Albanian or Greek, but they in fact were very much much like a, an Ottoman language uh, for the Balkans. And Ali Pasha Tepelana used this language when he wrote documents. Um, does, and it doesn't have to be appropriated as a nationalist indicator of one thing or the other. Um, so again, I think we need to go grassroots. We can't rely on established political enterprises who have uh, uh, who would find it impossible to actually initiate uh, debates at the uh, upper levels. Um, unfortunately, Chamri is really not an issue that's going to um, reach uh, Brussels uh, that in that direction or using those mechanisms. If there's grassroots operations, if there's solidarity between like-minded people in Greece, in Macedonia, in Albania, in the larger diaspora, getting academics involved, then I think we could actually create a space to talk about Shamriya and other issues. Again, we have to make this part of a larger global story. We would really benefit from having the outside world learning more about that how, how much similar the experience of Shamriya was to other people's experience with the modern state in the Cold War or in prior to the Cold War. And I can't remember. Uh, the other question. Yeah, so you can have my slides. Uh, what what can we do? Again, reach out for, and, uh, and I'll do my best to get my colleagues in Greece to be more active. But it also requires, we think, to get more people to stop studying computer engineering. Sorry, Greg, but I know it's, you're going to make your money, but those jobs, believe me, computer engineering, it's all in India now. So combine your skill set, be creative, use your skills and your interest in engineering, but also think creatively about how you can use that to uh, present this larger story of your existence, of your life, of your heritage, it's something to celebrate. And, and you can do that by, yes, being a computer engineer, but using it in ways that are um, sophisticated and complementary of this uh, larger global story we want to tell, make it. Great. I think. Um, would, would you would you like to take two more questions or? Sure. Um, sure. Okay. Sure. Perfect. Two more questions that are a, a bit related. So first, we have one uh, from uh, Paula Steiner who asks, um, in a very broad sense, uh, it seems that the plight of the Toms vis-à-vis -vis Greece is similar to that of the Armenians in Turkey or Azerbaijan. Uh, would you agree with this statement? And we have a similar question from Ani Strakosha, who says, um, "What is next for the Tom issue?" And he ties again the recent recognition of the Armenian genocide from the US government. Uh, is there such hope um, for the Cham issue? Uh, and does its scale meet the international uh, standards for more international attention? So we'll end with these two questions. OK. Uh, yeah, good questions. Uh, again, with frustrating uh, results or, or answer from my side, uh, I'm afraid that uh, unless we're able to um, make uh, Chamri a part of a larger phenomenon and story and bring it into these other uh, uh, platforms that are actually talking about this phenomenon in a, in a larger sense, uh, Chamri is, is, is not, uh, does not generate, the, does not kind of have the weight uh, to force uh, the United States to recognize it as a genocide. There's no way they're going to defy Greece in this regard. There's no way the EU is going to defy Greece. We, we can't even get Kosovo to be universally recognized because of Spanish and Greek uh, concerns about the precedent that this would set, right? At the same time, uh, if, it, if, it, if it's, again, done through grassroots organization, organization done through collaboration with others who have uh, similar um, um, kind of concerns about their own in, distinctive uh, um, tragedies, uh, it, that is more, um, I think, powerful in the long run, that it can actually be part of this larger comparative um, framework to understanding human suffering in the 20th century as a product of, of, of an era that uh, continues to live with the legacy till today. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the first question. Um, can you repeat remind me? Yeah, actually, it was the, the same question, like relating it perhaps to the Ar Ar Armenian case in Turkey. Oh, the Armenian, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah, the Armenian case, um, 
I think just by the power of the, uh, uh, the, the politics of Armenia it, throughout the 1920s and 1930s, the large numbers of Armenians who established and settle in France, in the United States in particular, and they become incredibly active. Really, I mean, just think about how long it's taken for even this initiative to be um, unleashed by an American uh, government that got so, gets every year lots of pressure from powerful Armenian groups in California and Michigan, uh, which these are very important places of lobbying, but they still could not get their case across uh, with considerable um, pushback because uh, countries that were, I, I think, wrongly identified as um, um, as contemporaries, they were not contemporaries, but um, certainly the, the, the horrors that happened did happen. Um, the very fact that uh, Turkey, in this case, uh, invested so much in countering with the position that very much like Greece takes regards to Chamriya, right? That we're an ally in the Cold War, we're too valuable for you to upset us. Um, and so um, Armenians who are much more organized and have much more resources and have far more powerful people representing their interests and have been very uniform in telling the story um, and have whole departments in universities teaching um, uh, the history of Armenians in this context. We don't have that uh, for peoples of the South Balkans. Yes, Greeks and the Slavs have their departments, but Albanian story is rarely told through this prison. Um, and so um, uh, we need to put, if, if we're interested in, in, in actually um, stepping up and stepping into some way, we should actually start investing in putting us endowed chairs for Albanian studies into universities. And maybe one generation from now, we can have PhDs that are actually writing about this. And then people who can actually have taken a class in, De in Detroit somewhere or California say, huh, this is actually something that uh, demands our attention. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll be left to speaking to each other, to ourselves. I find that a constant problem amongst Shukhtar is that we're, everyone agrees about certain common things, but how about to the larger world? Um, and we need to learn how to communicate the larger world um, and um, in a way that makes them understand, oh, this is actually significant to them. And it's, it's part of a larger global relevance as opposed to being just some little pet peeve for a group of people who, who um, have a, um, a webinar, which I'm very grateful that I've actually had a chance to communicate and meet some of you and uh, I'm more than happy to meet with any of you again. Um, you're welcome to contact me and, and if, if you have any further questions. And uh, Denny uh, and Gret and Arba, Arba, thank you very much for um, organizing this and good luck with your studies, your final exams. And um, hopefully we'll be able to see each other again soon. Yeah, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bumi, uh, and also to Dr. Yesini for her presentations and the Q&A, uh, and for helping us become more aware of the context of the CHAM issue and its complexity. Uh, your profound presentations have left us with so many thoughts and feelings, and I also see now messages from the audience who are you know, sharing the same, same sentiment. So we are so grateful for the time that you spent with us today, uh, and hope that maybe in the future, once the COVID situation is better, that we can even organize a similar event um, on Harvard's campus, actually, so uh, instead of virtually. And for the audience, we also hope that the discussion continues. Uh, it's so important that we shed light on these atrocities uh, and injustices instead of leaving them neglected in the shadow. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending, and have a great rest of your Sunday. Thank you, Dr. Bloom.